History has always been shaped by war. And through the ages, some battles have decided the fate of nations and still affect the way we live today. These are the great battles. The most decisive battle of the Hundred Years' War was fought here on this open field in northern France. In October 1415, 5,000 exhausted and starving Englishmen lined up in front of 30,000 Frenchmen. Yet despite being outnumbered six to one, Henry V's small English army achieved one of the most incredible reversals of fortune in military history. The Battle of Agincourt saw the English longbow destroy the cream of the French aristocracy. Ever since William the Bastard had crossed over the Channel from France and conquered England in 1066, the two countries had been locked in a bitter struggle for control of Normandy. Over the centuries, the English tried to settle the argument with force. In 1415, England was ruled by Henry V. Only 28 years old, Henry was a direct descendant of William the Conqueror. He fervently believed that he had the strongest claim to Normandy and by extension, the French crown. Henry began his campaign to take Normandy on the 13th of August, 1415, when he landed here, near the town of Harfleur, which is now part of the modern-day port of Le Havre. The English had arrived in force and were expecting to take Harfleur quickly before moving on to Paris. There were 8,000 archers and over 2,000 knights and men-at-arms. But right from the start, things didn't go according to plan. Harfleur had good natural defences. It was on a hill with marshes on one side and a massive ditch on the other. And the garrison inside its thick stone walls was determined to resist the English. Not surprisingly, Henry's army became involved in a long, drawn-out siege. Their supply of fresh food soon ran low. To make matters worse, there was no clean drinking water to be found in the surrounding area. Just about the only source of food was the local shellfish, which Henry's men consumed in huge quantities. It wasn't long before everyone in the English camp had dysentery. By the time Harfleur eventually capitulated five weeks later, 4,000 of Henry's men were either dead or on their way back to England. With autumn fast approaching, Henry was forced to abandon his campaign to take Normandy until the following year. But he'd made a huge song and dance about pursuing his ancestral rights and knew that if he returned to England now, his claim would be seen in France as a bit of a joke. What was required to save face was a show of force. Against the wishes of his council of war, Henry decided to march through Normandy and on to Calais, which at the time belonged to the English. Henry was sure that his choice of route home would show the French that he was still completely serious about his claim on Normandy. Leaving behind a quarter of his men to defend Harfleur, Henry set off on the 8th of October with only 4,000 archers and 900 knights. They had a week's rations, which in theory was just enough to see them through the 160-kilometer trip to Calais. It was the start of an extraordinary expedition across northern France that would climax in a great battle between the English and French at a little village called Agincourt. 
the French had been slowly gathering in force since Henry's arrival in Normandy. But they had done nothing to relieve the siege of Harfleur. The delay was caused by the lack of any unified chain of command. The French king was prone to bouts of insanity and believing himself to be made of glass was clearly unfit to command his own troops. It was eventually decided that the French army would be led by a council of war consisting of the five most powerful nobles in the land. The most influential of these was Constable d'Albray. D'Albray was a very experienced soldier and knew just how formidable the English could be. He convinced the other nobles that the best course of action was to starve Henry's army into submission. In order to do this, they would have to cut off the most direct route to Calais. Henry's men were walking into a trap. When they reached the Somme on the 13th of October, they found that the only crossing was blocked by Dalbray and 6,000 Frenchmen. But the king was determined to press on to Calais. The two armies began a deadly game of cat and mouse. As the English pushed south along the Somme in the hope of finding an undefended crossing, they were closely shadowed by the French on the northern bank. Dalbray's plan was working. Ten days after leaving Harfleur, the English had finished off the last of their provisions and were living off nuts and berries. The situation was getting desperate, but Henry was still determined to reach Calais. Ordering a forced march, he moved his army inland to escape the French. Unbeknown to Henry, the French army on the other side of the river was just a vanguard. When this force lost track of the English, it moved north and was joined by another 25,000 men. When the English returned to the Somme, much further upriver, the French were nowhere to be seen. Henry's men were finally able to cross without being attacked, and after a day's rest, the English resumed their march north. Late on the 24th of October, their luck ran out. The French were blocking the road to Calais, near the little village of Agincourt. The English were only a few days' march from safety, but outnumbered six to one, a fight now seemed unavoidable. Henry's army was in a wretched state, but they were all seasoned and experienced troops and most of them were armed with the most formidable weapon of its time. The longbow was a uniquely English invention and it dominated the medieval battlefield. The French had archers of their own, but their bows lacked the power of those used by Henry's army. The longbow is over two meters long. It's made of a solid piece of yew that's flat at the back with a rounded belly. And it's this design that gives it its incredible power. It takes an enormous amount of upper body strength to draw the bow. I'm really struggling. But under battle conditions, the English archers were strong enough to shoot six to eight arrows per minute. A variety of arrowheads were made, but the arrows used by Henry's archers in France were nearly all fitted with the bodkin point. The bodkin was specially designed to pierce the plate armor worn by knights. Each archer carried a sheath of up to 50 arrows. Taking care to pick their targets, the archers would wait until the enemy was only 50 meters away. At this range, the bodkin point was deadly. In massed ranks, the English archers were the 15th century equivalent of machine guns. One Englishman wrote at the time, 
The might of the realm standeth upon archers who are not rich men. But Henry knew his archers were extremely vulnerable to cavalry attack. He ordered his men to make two meter long wooden stakes. Sharpened at both ends and hammered into the ground at a 45 degree angle, the stakes were designed to form a crude but highly effective defensive barrier. At first light on the 25th of October, 1415, the English took up their positions in front of the French. They were cold, tired and starving. Many of them were still suffering from dysentery. Outnumbered six to one, escape, let alone victory, must have seemed totally out of the question. Only a few short hours later, they'd be fighting for their lives. At the start of October 1415, Henry V had to abandon his campaign to take Normandy. Instead of returning home, he had decided to make a show of force by marching 5,000 of his troops through northern France to Calais. But only a few days from safety, the English found themselves cornered and outnumbered six to one. 30,000 Frenchmen now stood in their way. Early in the morning on the 25th of October, the two sides stood facing each other near the little village of Agincourt. Only a thousand meters of open fields separated the armies. It was the feast day of St. Crispin, traditionally a time of great celebration. But Henry's men were in no mood for festivities. They were tired, hungry, and many of them were still suffering from dysentery. In stark contrast, the French were in an exuberant mood. The odds were stacked in their favor. Many of them had even started celebrating the night before and were now laughing off their hangovers. There seemed to be no way out for the English. Henry deployed his army in a defensive formation. His knights formed the center of the line and he placed the majority of his archers on the flanks. Just before the battle, the king rode along the lines and addressed his army. The king told his men that they'd come to France to fight for his lawful inheritance. If they won, they'd be heroes. But if they lost, the king reminded them that the French had promised to cut off the two fingers of every archer they captured so that they could never again use a bow. The long march across northern France was now about to reach its bloody conclusion. Fired up by their king's powerful speech, Henry's men made their final preparations. The English soldiers went down on one knee and made the sign of the cross. In a symbolic gesture, they grabbed a handful of soil and put it in their mouths. It was a sign that they were prepared to die if necessary and be buried here in France. The French deployed in three divisions. The first consisted of 8,000 knights with 5,500 archers on the flanks. Another 6,000 knights formed the second line and 10,000 on horseback made up the third. Even more cavalry were on the flanks. The French had time and numerical superiority on their side. They fully expected Henry to negotiate his way out of trouble. But the English king knew that this would be the end of his ambitions in France and had no intention of backing down. The standoff between the two sides lasted four hours. In an attempt to seize the initiative, Henry decided to provoke a fight and get the French to attack his defensive formation. In an audacious move, the English king ordered his men to up sticks and move slowly up the field towards the enemy. Henry had made it clear he intended to fight 
The French men-at-arms frantically jostled for position. Everybody wanted the honour of being the first to have a go at the English. Arguments broke out amongst the nobles, who pulled rank and worked their way to the front, pushing the archers and crossbowmen to the rear. Henry's men kept advancing until they were only 250 metres from the French. Thick woods on both sides of the battlefield now protected his troops. In one bold move, he'd made it impossible for the French to encircle his army. Once again, the English hammered their stakes into the ground. From their new position, the archers fired a volley of arrows straight into the French ranks. Little damage was caused, but this provocative act had exactly the effect Henry desired. In response, the French cavalry on the flanks charged the English line. They'd taken the bait, and without anyone in overall command, there was no one to stop them. The cavalry hurtled down both sides of the field, followed on foot by the first division of knights. The thick woods prevented the cavalry from circling behind the English line. Instead, they were forced into a head-on collision with the English archers. The French cavalry were met by a storm of armor-piercing arrows. Horses and riders were sent crashing to the ground. Stunned by this awesome firepower, the French cavalry were forced into the centre of the battlefield before retreating back towards their own lines. Chaos ensued as the cavalry ran straight into their own men, forcing them into densely packed formations. Henry's archers waited until the French were only 60 metres away and then unleashed volley after volley of arrows. Just imagine what it would have been like for the French, advancing across this field in full armour and knee-deep in mud, and with every step, thousands more armour-piercing arrows slamming into their ranks. Every minute, the French were being hit by over 30,000 arrows. There was no escape from the onslaught. Clambering over dead bodies, the French advanced slowly towards the English knights. With thousands of French troops pushing from the rear, the pressure on the front ranks must have been unbearable. The men-at-arms leading the attack would have found it almost impossible to remain on their feet. The French eventually reached the English front line. They were completely exhausted and so tightly packed together, they hardly had room to use their weapons. The narrow width of the battlefield had completely neutralized the French army's massive numerical advantage. Row after row of French men-at-arms were literally pushed onto the English front line. Many of the French lost their footing, and as they lay sprawling on the ground, little hit squads of English archers ran out to finish them off. The 6,000 knights that made up the second French division moved down the field to join the battle, but this only increased the pressure on those at the front. Some of the French tried to surrender, but were hacked to death by battle-crazed Englishmen. Others were trampled by their own men and suffocated in the crush. The English were doing the impossible and beating an army six times their own size. Piles of dead Frenchmen littered the battlefield. The third French division stood rooted to the spot, watching the carnage in total disbelief. After an hour of fighting, the first and second French divisions, a total of 14,000 men, were defeated and forced to retreat. Of those abandoned or lying wounded in front of the English positions, many were simply held down and finished off. The lucky ones were taken prisoner. The French had their hands bound and were led to the rear. These nobles could be ransomed after the battle, 
and hundreds of Henry's knights left the front line to guard their prisoners. But just as it seemed that the battle was over, Henry received two pieces of worrying news. The first was that the English camp, situated to the rear, was being overrun. The second was that the 3rd French Division, consisting of 10,000 cavalry, was preparing to attack. Suddenly, Henry thought he was about to be hit on two fronts at the same time. He needed every man available, including those guarding the French. In a highly controversial move, Henry ordered the prisoners to be killed. But the threat failed to materialize. The English camp had been attacked by a handful of knights and 600 peasants who were easily chased away. And when it transpired that the 3rd French Division had not been about to attack, but was in fact withdrawing from the battlefield, Henry stopped the killing. But by the time the order was given, hundreds of French prisoners had been butchered in cold blood. It's thought that a total of 10,000 Frenchmen were killed at Agincourt. The English lost perhaps as few as 400. With the battle over, Henry's men began to scour the field, removing anything of value from the dead. Two days later, Henry arrived in Calais before returning home to England and a hero's welcome. His march through Normandy had very nearly ended in disaster, but thanks to the longbow, the English had beaten the odds. This great battle saw the English destroy the cream of the French aristocracy. It would take a generation for them to recover. After Agincourt, there was almost nothing to stop Henry's ambition. Over the next five years, the rest of France, including Paris, fell to the English. Henry eventually married the daughter of the King of France and became first in line to the French throne. But he was to die seven weeks before his new father-in-law and never lived to hold the thrones of both England and France.